you please welcome to stage Tom O'Donnell! <laughs> it's as if he's never left. So. Uh, yes, hello. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm Tom O'Donnell, and I study medieval Irish uh, history, Woo! which is pretty good. Yeah, but specifically literature, so it's not really history as in dates and facts and things that happened. It's more stories. Um, and more astute amongst you would have noticed by now that, although I am called Tom O'Donnell, and although I study medieval Irish, and although I speak a little bit of Irish, I am achingly English. And this, like, apologising for not dancing in a Pim's tent sort of English. <laughs> And so on, on paper, it's good, but you know, say, oh, this is a little Irish, he's got an Irish name, he's those Irish stuff, brilliant, let's get him down. And then I turn up, not a uh, twinkly-eyed little, uh, little Irish fella, which is fine uh, for academically, but online dating, I've disappointed a number of women before it even started. Um, anyway, so yes, no, history. Um, yeah, so I can't really talk about Ireland or history in Ireland this week without uh, mentioning the fantastic results of the marriage referendum on Friday. Exactly. I thought it would be a, a, a sympathetic crowd. Um, and yes, I mean, students of medieval Ireland would have known that of course it would have passed because the medieval Irish were quite happy with uh, the same-sex marriage and um, just gayness in general. Um, and so I'm going to tell you why why that is. So the first, the, the No campaign, uh, one of their big points was that if you had gay marriage, then a child wouldn't be reared by mother and father, and that would turn them weird for some reason. Um, so we must keep, uh, the, keep away from same-sex marriage. But medieval Irish were very happy with one sex, one gender, rearing a child. Um, so in the monasteries, for example, they were taking children at a very, very young age, uh, boys, and they'd be reared in an all-male environment, and they turned out all right. And there were three, three... No, they did, they did. It was all right. Don't worry about it. Um, so there, there are three saints' lives in which we go into this in detail. But because they're saints' lives, you can't just let reality stand on its own. You need to kind of jazz it up a bit, Jesus style. So they have miracles. These three uh, male saints uh, take in children from at a young age, and to feed them, they all miraculously lactate. So the first one, I think we're going, is pretty standard. Uh, the Queen of Leinster has baby, and uh, he takes her in, takes the baby into his monastery, that he's running on strict 10-year-old uh, treehouse guidelines that is no girls allowed. <laughs> so she has to stay outside. But the baby comes in, and he feeds the baby from his right breast, milk out the right breast, fine, everyone's a winner. <laughs> the next one, Coleman Ayla, um, he needs to step it up a notch, because, well, for one, he has to look after twins. Uh, and these twins are, um, they're brought to him by his cousin, Columba, of Iona fame. That's Iona the monastery, not Iona the institute. Um, Irish joke. And, uh, uh, yeah, so, so Columba comes to Colman and says, well, I've got these twins. Uh, they're the product of incest, um, so they're not really, I can't really be associated with them. Um, I had a word with some of the boys, and we think we should probably kill them. <laughs> But um, that's not really going to go well for sort of my own PR. Do you have any ideas? And Coleman Ayla says, well, lucky for you, uh, I have a talent such that no other man in Ireland has. <laughs> out of my right breast, I can produce milk, and out of my left, I can produce honey. He's, he's very much a walking breakfast bar. <laughs> um, and he raised him, and that, that, that's great. The final uh, one, who is, uh, he's not a saint himself, he's the uncle of a saint the uncle of St. Freud, he wasn't really paying attention when they did the whole anatomy thing because he takes the baby Freud away from his mother, the uncle's uh, sister. Um, she's very upset about this, but because it's medieval Irish literature, we don't care what women think. And um, he raises the child uh, by having the child suckle his earlobe. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had to give this uh, an actual proper... Um, I gave this proper talk in front of academics the other day, and when it got to this stage, I was like, yeah, he suckles him from his ear. I, I, I don't know why. Like, there's, there's no reason. And maybe it looks a bit like a nipple if you squint. No, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, but it's not just men, of course, who can look after children. It's women. So, um, in case you didn't know, that's a fact. You can keep that. Um, 
Yeah, so, uh, so Finn McCool of Fenian literature fame, a uh, big explosion in the 12th century of Fenian literature, preserved in the Ossianic tradition that you might have come across if you're that kind of person. <laughs> and yeah, Finn McCool was raised by two women, Leith Lucre and the Bob Mall, who were female warriors and poets who lived in the wilderness. And he turned out all right. Well, except he didn't really. He was an eternal man child who married a number of women simultaneously, a lot of them far too young for him, and ended up chasing his best mate around Ireland before killing him. Um, but he does have the coolest name in all of literature. I mean, literally, cool is in his name. He is Finn McCool. <laughs> so we can't really hold that against him. Uh, but it's not just about rearing children, of course. It is about uh, having homosexual relations. Um, and because these are texts written down by monks, written and copied and written and copied, over hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, we can't really put it out in the open. We need to sort of subtly allude to it. Um, and this allusion comes in... Um, one of the most famous uh, tales in medieval Ireland, the Toyn, the Cattle Road of Cooley, the one that has the Penguin edition, so you might have read it, it's been translated, it's fine. Um, and uh, yeah, so this happens at the big climax of the battle. You have the lone defender of Ulster, Cucullin, has to fight his foster brother, Ferdia, uh, in the ford. Uh, Ferdia has been tricked onto going on the other side, uh, and so the wheels of tragedy have pulled them together in this final titanic conflict. Um, it's very sad. And uh, they, they say poems to each other before the fight begins to try and dissuade each other from fighting. It's very touching stuff. And the fight goes on for three days. And at the end of each day, uh, Cucullin sends his doctors to Ferdia, and Ferdia sends his victuals and food to Cucullin. Uh, and it's very nice. Until the final day, when Ferdia seems to have the upper hand. He's got Cucullin over in the ford. He's on his last legs. There have been three days of fighting. They've beaten each other up incredibly. Uh, and Ferdia's about to deliver the coup de grace, as it were. And uh, luckily, Cucullin has a special power, this thing called the Guy Bolger. It um, translates to the lightning spear, which is a skill that only he has. Um, and so he decides to use it at this opportune moment. And he grabs it in between his toes and flings it down the river, because that's apparently how it works. <laughs> Ferdia <laughs> sees this coming, tries to block it with a shield. That fails. It goes past the shield, past Ferdia, and then back up his ass. <laughs> And then the barbs explode into each of his veins. Ferdia says, ow. I don't know, he literally does. It's just, oh, you have, you have killed me. Um, and then dies. Kukulin picks Ferdia up and uh, carries him bodily out of the ford, kind of like the end of an officer and a gentleman, but with a lot more death. Um, and so, yeah, there you have it. There's the end. So we have two men who have been brought up together at essentially boarding school. They give each other gifts, they write poems to each other, and finally one sticks the other with a spear up his ass. <laughs> now, this, now, this is, uh, I'm so, sorry, blah, blah, sad to say, this is a lesson in historical misdirection. Whilst all that's true, that did, well, not true, but it happened in the story. <laughs> you, can, you can read it. Um, that interpretation is, uh, is, is wrong, it's not really gay. I wrote a quite an interesting piece about it on notchesblog.com, and you can go and check that out, as to why it's not really gay. I mean, do write it down, I'll give you a moment. Um, yeah, so uh, even in the world of stories, uh, history's all lies, really. And with that, I'll let you go to the interval. See you later. <laughs>